You can start now. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming to the full council tonight, welcoming councillors, officers, and members of the public. But before we do start the meeting, we have to remember Francis, um, Councillor Francis Mason, who sadly we've lost in the last week. Um, she was a one off, she was considerate, she was kind. She thought of um, fighting for justice. She was had a lot of t uh, tolerance. She was very compassionate and she was a great friend and she will be sadly missed. But all the things I've just mentioned about her will be a legacy for us as councillors and for the council and the town. Um, our thoughts, I know, go to her family at this time as well. And um, I know that Councillor Mark Ingle and Councillor Andrew Johnson want to say a few words about that, Francis. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Chair. Justice, yeah. fairness and equality. Principles Francis brought to every aspect of her life. She was the obvious choice for responsibility in the council. As a portfolio holder, ensuring equality and proper governance. She was a stickler for detail. And in the short time she took on this role, she made a huge impact. Sometimes her insights would leave us feeling uncomfortable, but that was only because she was unerringly right in her analysis. As a result of her work, we have identified areas where we need to improve as a council. We will take her ideas forward. Kindness. Councillor Vince said to me when hearing the tra tragic news, Frances was one of the kindest and most compassionate people I have known. Everything she did, her job with the probationary service, her work for the Labour Party and her support for local charities, she did because she wanted to help people and support them when times were rough. I agree with Chris. Wisdom and honesty. There are many of us here tonight who can attest to Frances's ability to give an unvarnished appraisal of a situation getting straight to the heart of the issue. Many was the time I've telephoned her to ask advice, and as a result of her input, reflected on a position or an issue or direction and refined the work being done. I am truly grateful for her input and I shall miss her counsel. Hard working. Come rain or shine, if there were doors to knock on, Francis would be out knocking on doors. If leaflets needed to be delivered, she would deliver leaflets. If careful research had to be done, Francis could be trusted to put in the hours. Fun. Both Councillor Jezzard and Councillor Shears spoke to me of Francis's wit, humour, her ability to entertain and have fun. One particular evening they remembered was on February the 14th, Valentine's night when she organised a rival event for the girls, Galentine's Night, a fairly raucous event by the sound of it. Valentine's, Galentine's, I think I know which I'd prefer to go on. I'm also reliably informed that Frances coped with her nerves when disagreeing with the leader of the opposition by remembering him and picturing him as a 12 year old boy he was when they first met. Love. Francis loved and was loved. She leaves behind her husband, Paul, and her daughters, Charlie and Cassie, who, as well as suffering the tragic and untimely loss of their mother, only very recently had to come to terms with the loss of their grandmother, Francis's mother. She was loved also by her friends, her colleagues, and her comrades, and by so many people whose lives she touched. Justice. Fairness, equality, kind, wise, honest and hardworking, full of fun and loved by so many. Councillor Francis Mason. Francis is an awful loss to her family and to the town of Harlow. Thank you, Councillor Engel. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's with deep sadness that I speak to the Chamber on the loss of Francis Mason. The loss of any councillor um, from this town is sad, um, but Francis, um, I have known 
on and off for many years, as the leader has already said. Um, and I've always found I always found her a woman of compassion and a woman that cared deeply about the town in which she lived and served. Um, I know that her passing has affected many of her friends on the other side of the chamber deeply. And I can see the level of affection that she was held in uh, by members. I asked my members um, so for some thoughts before I spoke tonight, Chair. And um, Councillor David Carter told me that um, Francis was always engaging and um, asked searching questions when he served time with her on the, um, uh, the panels that he served with her, um, and that she wasn't happy until she got to the root of the question, until she got her answer. Um, other councillors in my group have told me that um, she was always engaged, no matter what the subject matter, whatever meeting she was on, she was always engaged and willing to ask a question if she felt she didn't know or she felt she needed to elucidate something. Um, she will be missed from this council, um, and I offer my thoughts, my group's thoughts and condolences um, to her friends on the other side, to her friends outside of the political world, and to her family. May she rest in peace. Thank both of you, and now we will come to one minute silence as we, we think back on the life of Francis Mason. Okay, that's the minute over, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll now come on to the agenda. Item one, apologies for absence. Who do we have? Councillor Mallard? Uh, Councillor Emma Toll and Councillor Tony Durkin. Thank you. Any other apologies? No, okay. Item two, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations? No, not hearing any. Okay. On to item three, the minutes on pages four to 17 of the meeting of the 29th of October, 2020. Okay. Item four, communication. Excuse me, Chair. Chair. Excuse me, Chair. I do have a point. I, I did have my hand up. Right. On the minutes. Okay, we don't normally take to do, um, we just do the minutes as is at the moment, but okay. Chair, if it's a matter of accuracy, uh, right. Councillor Hardware can raise a matter of accuracy. It, right. Okay, Councillor Hardware. Well, in the, in the minutes under, I think, items uh, 34, which is a question, my question, question five, Councillor question, uh, it says that uh, the leader would arrange to have um, the uh, amount of um, New Homes bonus the council has received from the government for Terminus House and the other PD rights uh, written to me, and I haven't had it, so it's not quite accurate, and I haven't had it. Okay, thank you for raising that, Councillor Hardware. Okay, we now go on to communications from the Chair, item four. Um, we had the long service awards for our um, offices, on November the 4th, but we had to do it on Zoom, but it was a very good worthwhile meeting to the reflections of other councillors on long serving council offices in, in Harlow. Um, I filmed on my own um, down at Netswell Cross, filmed um, laying the wreath for the, the um, virtual service that was held on the uh, 8th of November 
um, which I sadly missed because it's such a wonderful event every year. And on the 13th of November, the last one, we had a virtual coffee morning with mayors and chairs from across Essex, and that was held um, through the Mayor of Chelmsford. Okay, petitions from the public, we have none. Now we get on for questions from the public, and we've got the first patch question is from Mick Patrick. Uh, he was here. Is he? Uh, Mick, are you there? Yeah, do we to read it? Uh, if you um, want to read it, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, reference government white paper consultations. I have read and replied to the government white paper on new proposed planning legislation. The, the paper totally removes the 1947 Planning Act, deregulating the rights of councils and communities to they want to move consultation online rather than putting notices on lampposts, meaning they don't want local people to know about specific proposals. This will affect the democratic right of communities and, and to comment, or comment on and object to specific proposals, which we make our home and neighborhoods, creating poorly planned developments. Does this mean development, developments will be able Developers will be able to fill in hollow screen spaces and sites like our showground that was fought for, uh, fought for will be built on within 18 months of putting planning process in place. That's my first question. Okay, this was to Councillor Danny Purton. So Councillor Purton, can you reply? Or um, Nick, would you like this taken as read? Um, if you re reply well, and if I could have a copy sent to me, that would be appreciated. Okay. Right, okay, so Councillor Purton, can you read this um, question, the answer out, please? Thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you, Michael, for putting the question. Um, in Harlow Council's response to the planning white paper consultation that you refer to, we also expressed our concerns at the democratic deficit that would arise from these proposals. The switch in emphasis in focusing consultation on the local plan stage <coughs> rather than that planning application stage will mean that many people are not able to comment on and influence development that is to take place around them in their immediate neighbourhood. However, I can provide an assurance that Harlow's green wedges and other green spaces, such as the showground in the town park that you referred to, are safe from development. At this meeting tonight, later on, there is a motion to adopt Harlow's local development plan for the period up to 2033. This provides strengthened policies to protect our green spaces from development. I would draw people's attention to policies WE1 and WE2 in this new local plan. Obviously, that doesn't mean much without the <laughs> policies in front of them, but it's coming up later. The independent inspector appointed to assess this local plan made it very clear that these spaces are to be protected from development as an intrinsic design feature of the town. Even if the government's proposals as set out in the white paper become law, and I have to say that given the objection from not just uh, the Labour Party, but many um, Tory councillors, I wonder if it ever will be implemented, but if it was, our green spaces will still be protected. The proposals would see all land being zoned as either growth areas, renewal areas, or areas for protection. All those green spaces would be classified as protected areas, meaning that they will be governed by the local policies that we have in place through our local development plan. Thank you, Captain. Uh, Mick, do you want a supplementary on this question? Yeah. Um, um, well, I hope it's relevant, really. Um, many of my, my members and, 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 and associates have um, raised the question of Acacia House. What, what is the future for that? And obviously, you know, I know we, we know pretty sure it's going to be demolished, but is there any plans for development there? What will it be? Councillor Purton. <laughs> No, unfortunately, I, I'm not uh, responsible for that particular development. And unfortunately, the 
cabinet member who he is 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 uh, is not here tonight. But I will uh, ensure that uh, a, a statement is sent to uh, Michael um, as soon as possible, outlining whether the council's got any involvement in Acacia House and whether we uh, obviously have any information about what's going to happen to it. Thank you, Councillor Burton. Uh, Mick, you've got a qu another question for Councillor Burton? Please. Um, reference, right. can I stop? Yeah? Yeah, Ref carry on. Yeah, okay. Reference to government white paper. With the removal of section 106 that, that has been deregulated over several years means we will see very little much needed social housing or council housing being built in the future. Uh, thank you, Michael. Again, as in Harlow Council's response to the white paper consultation, we expressed our concerns about these proposals as they could have a significant negative impact upon the ability to deliver social housing, which uh, is what you refer to. The creation of a national infrastructure fund, which is what's proposed, could in theory result in more money being available from development, I say in theory, since the creation of, cer creation of certainty at the start of a development process reduces risk for a developer. However, it's also clear that the government's proposals for the delivery of affordable housing through developer contributions is only intended to be targeted at the delivery of what they call first homes. This will see the focus on developers providing subsidised homes for purchase rather than for affordable or social rent. Hollow Council has submitted an objection to this proposal on that basis and many other local authorities have raised other concerns about the white paper proposals. It's by no means certain that they will all come into practice because, as I've said before, there's lots of people objecting to this removal of democracy. However, even if they do, Harlow Council remains committed to the delivery of council housing. We will still build new council homes, utilising other funding mechanisms, and the delivery of new council homes at Bushycroft and the formal list, former Lister House site will commence in 2021. This follows the completion of the Prentice Place development this year, all of which is intended and is council housing. Thank you, Councillor Purton. Uh, Mick, have you got a supplementary on that question? No, it's all fine, thank you. Okay, then thank you very much for raising those questions. Um, okay, question three, Dennis Bupantu um, from the Youth Council um, wants to ask a question of Councillor Chris Vince. Dennis, are you there? Yes, I am here. Okay, if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, good evening, Council events. The Youth Council is aware that the Harlow Council has donated money from the cancelled fireworks display to the Harlow Food Bank that will help give food parcels to vulnerable families. Are there any plans to continue to support young people and their families throughout the Christmas period and throughout the pandemic? Thank you. Councillor Chris Vince, can you reply to that? Yeah, thank you for the question, Dennis, and thank you um, to yourself and the other youth councillors for all the um, hard work and support that you've given other young people in our town during this terrible time. Um, throughout the pandemic, Harlow Council have been working with Rainbow Services and other organisations in the voluntary sector to support vulnerable families and other residents that have been affected by COVID-19. The Harlow Community Club provides advice to residents regarding access to food and prescriptions, along with referrals to Harlow Food Bank and Community Embrace, as well as signposts to a range of other support services. Harlow Council aims to ensure that no one in Harlow goes hungry during these difficult times and will continue to work with the Essex Lifestyle Service and other partnership organisations to ensure that uh, residents receive the support that they need. There is potential for the remaining funding which was given to the food bank for over half term to be used again, either during Christmas or next year, in case the money given to central government is not sufficient to feed those in need across Harlow. The Harlow Health and Wellbeing Board has utilised public health grant funding to assist the delivery of a range of initiatives to support vulnerable children and families during the pandemic, including the Harlow Grows Project, Boxes of Hope 
and Harlow Holiday Lunch Clubs. And I will go a little bit off, off, off piece here, if I may, um, just to say that I, I've been inundated by organisations who uh, are looking to get support from that particular fund um, to do some fantastic work to support young people uh, in Harlow um, with their mental health and their wellbeing. The government recently announced a £400 million winter grant scheme to support vulnerable families and local agencies and are now working together to ensure Harlow's share of this money reaches those in need in our communities. Some of this funding will be accessible to residents through the Essential Living Fund and Active Essex will lead on the provision of free holiday hunger activity clubs across Essex, including obviously Harlow, from, from the, second of, uh, sorry, the 20th of December. These clubs will provide physical activity opportunities and a nutrition meal, as well as food hampers to take home for families. Dennis, would you like to have a supplementary? Would you like to ask um, a question of Councillor Vince? Uh, no, I do not have a supplementary question. Thank you okay, very, very much, Councillor Vince. In that question. Um, Bethany Tasker, um, you also have a question for Councillor Chris Vince. Could you read out your question, dear? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Councillor Vince. As young people can be the spreaders of COVID-19 virus, youth councillors are concerned about the lack of social distancing in schools and when school finishes for the day and young people travel home. Are there any plans for the council to use its social media platforms to engage better with younger people to get the message across about the importance of everyone following the rules? Councillor Vince. Thank you for your question, Beth. And, and again, so, so, okay, the same thing I said to Dennis. Thank you for the work you've done with the Youth Council um, during this really terrible time. And you won't be surprised to know that this is obviously a, a question that's obviously very close to my heart, both as a former teacher, um, as, a, uh, as a partner who is a teacher, and also lots of friends who are in the teaching profession, um, and obviously having worked with a lot of young people over the years. Um, Harlow Council recognises during the pandemic, communication with residents of all ages is key. We recognise that for young people, this is a very scary and difficult time and that um, it is difficult to do what is best when balancing the needs to keep safe and the desire to be successful at school and socialising with friends. Harlow Council will continue to provide, hopefully, uh, useful information on social media, advertising all residents in our town about the importance of following the government's guidelines and what everything, everyone can do to reduce the spread of this virus. However, in response to your specific point, our comms team are working with the youth and citizenship team to look at how we can best communicate the importance to young of, of young people um, to social distancing, of wearing face masks, and to continue to ensure that we sanitise both ourselves and our workspaces until we have seen the end of this terrible pandemic. As part of Essex County Council's Let's Stop the Spread campaign, the council is also working with the county council to identify key influence and person entities who can help to engage with communities, community, uh, sorry, engage with and communicate messages to families and young people through different social media channels. Bethany, oh, do you have... Went off in the middle of that. <laughs> okay, thanks, Councillor Vince. Bethany, do you have a supplementary? No, that's fine, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, um, I understand that um, Nick, Nick Taylor um, is not going to be coming online, so um, Lisa will be reading out his question. Thank you, Chair. I understand that the policy and procedures used in respect of the sale of council-owned land dating back to 1996 are to be reviewed and revised in 2021. Current procedures do not require officers to consult with residents living nearby before a decision is made to sell land and such a decision is left up to an officer discretion, subject to a number of criteria. It is clear that a land sale can have a detrimental effect on neighbouring properties and their occupants and a decision to sell without neighbouring residents and a member involvement lacks any kind of transparency. Will you give an undertaking that the review in spring of 2021 will include the need for written consultation to take place with neighbours living in the vicinity of all proposed land sales and that councillors are involved when the council make a final decision on whether to proceed with the sale. And that question is to Councillor Mike Danvers. So Councillor Danvers, will you read out your... Well, I take it as red, Chair, if, if Nick isn't here. Okay, right, thank you very much. Okay, um, Nick Taylor also asked um, another question of uh, Councillor Danvers, uh, question six. Um, so Lisa, will you read that one out as well, please? Thanks, Chair. In some cases, residents seeking to build a new home in their garden 
will need to purchase land owned by the council in order to give access to the garden. In legal circles, such land is known as a ransom strip. In order to, tr to be transparent and upfront, a neighbouring authority explains at the outset that it uses a sum which involves the following, the sale value of the new home to be built, for example, 400,000, then taking off the build costs and associated fees, say 150,000 pounds, leaving a profit of 250,000 pounds for the applicant. The council will expect to receive one third of this profit, 83,333 pounds to be paid by the applicant on the sale of the new home. Can you tell me how Highlow Council or its agent determines the value of the ransom strip? Again, the question is to Councillor Mike Danvers. Councillor Danvers, do you want to um, read well, this? Once again, Chair, could you take it as read, please? Okay, thank if you. Nick, if Nick was here, obviously I would give him the courtesy yeah. of, a, okay. of a, a reply. Um, Another question seven from Alan Leverett to Councillor Tony Durkin. Um, Councillor Tony Durkin is not here tonight. Um, Lisa, do you want to read the question or should we bypass that one? No, I believe there's another councillor going to respond on Councillor Durkin's behalf. Uh, right, OK, thank you. So if you can read that question out, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Could you please inform me how much it has cost the council to refurbish the flats at Prentice Place, excluding the costs associated with the remodelling of the external areas? And the councillor replying to... Thank you, Chair. I'm taking it. OK. Thanks, Councillor Ingle. Uh, yeah, I'm replying in Councillor Durkin's absence. Um, thank you, Alan, for your question. The cost of refurbishing the flats at Prentice Place, excluding the remodelling of the external areas, is in the region of uh, 2.845 million. This work includes new kitchens and bathrooms, new double glazing, new gas boilers, new front doors, new pitched roof on all three blocks and guttering and new communal lighting, communal security doors with intercom system, new bin stores and cycle storage, the removal of asbestos and a security camera system. Okay, I uh, question eight again was um, from Anne Leverett and this was to Councillor Mark Wilkinson. Anissa, can you that? Thanks, Chair. Bearing in mind the ever-increasing demand for housing, can you explain why it's taken so long for the flats apprentice place to be occupied by the tenants? And Councillor Wilkinson, can you read that reply? Thank you very much, Chair. And again, uh, many thanks to uh, Mr Leverett for an excellent question. My response, Prentice Place scheme provides badly needed new council homes that will be allocated to applicants on the council's housing needs register. Additional works were required for fire stopping and building control priorities, aligning to new government guidance for new build properties. The ongoing pandemic also delayed works during the lockdown. However, it is anticipated that these properties will be advertised to residents in December 2020 this month. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Question nine from James Humphreys to Councillor Mark Ingle. And again, I think that, Lisa, you're going to read this question out. Thanks, Chair. Harlow Council statement about its town fund bin bid published on the 4th of November refers to the Harlow Growth Board, which is a partnership of local, public, private and voluntary organisations. Having checked the list of these organisations and individuals, it appears that no Conservative councillor is involved. There is little, if any, representation on behalf of residents and many participants may not live in Harlow. On reflection, do you think the residents of Harlow could and should be better represented on the board, who, after all, will be making very important decisions about the future of Harlow in the coming months? Councillor, yeah. apology, questions to Councillor Mark Ingle. Uh, thank you, Mr Humphreys, for your question. Harlow Growth Board's remit is to drive the sustainable economic regeneration of the town to deliver long-term economic and productivity growth. 
The board has been established following the government guidance on running a town board, which includes advice about which organisations the membership should rep represent. Harlow Growth Board includes representatives from key organisations and businesses which are based within Harlow, along with representation from Rainbow Services, the umbrella organisation for community and voluntary organisations based in Harlow, along with key local councillors, the local member of parliament for Harlow is represented. Harlow Growth Board can, if it feels it's appropriate, review its membership in the future. Thank you, Councillor Ingle. Um, another question um, to Councillor Mark Ingle is um, at question 10, and that's from James Humphreys. And I believe, again, Lisa, you'll be reading this question out. Thank you, Chair. The statement goes on to thank those who participated in the consultation exercise leading to this bid. On checking the government website of My Town Harlow, one of the vehicles used to consult with residents, I know that just 130 people responded. Can you tell me what other steps were taken by Harlow Council to consult with residents before its bid was made and how many responses were received from individuals and organisations? Again, question to Councillor Mark Pingle. Again, thank you very much for that question. The Towns Fund bid had to meet the strict criteria set out by the government. A long list of potential projects that fitted within the funding guidelines was developed after reviewing the council's existing pipeline of projects. The responses from previous consultations and public engagement that have been undertaken over recent years, such as through our social media channels, the consultation we ran for the future High Street Fund bid, Harlow and Gilston Garden Town Ned consultations, as well as feedback and in, uh, sorry, I lost my place, um, as long, Sorry. As well as feedback and engagement we've received through our partner forums and networks. The long list of projects was presented to the Growth Board and they had the chance to add any additional schemes that they felt were missing. We then undertook a robust process of shortlisting and prioritising the projects, which included asking the Growth Board members to indicate their top three projects and a final review process that ensured that the final selection of projects delivered the level of impact that the growth board wished to be delivered through this funding opportunity. The projects that were selected for the town's fund bid were then consulted on via social media and our website. The social media campaign reached 10,998 people engaged with 3,854 people and received 85 comments within five days of being launched. We are currently waiting for confirmation from the government that we can proceed with our bid. Once we get the go ahead, we move to developing the full business cases for the projects included in the bid. And this process will involve more extensive community consultation on the details of these projects. Thank you, Councillor Ingle. Okay, that's finished the public questions. We now go on to item seven, the questions from councillors. And the first one is from Councillor Michael Hardware. To, ah, okay. Um, this is to Councillor Tony Durkin. So do you want to read your question out, Councillor Hardware? Yes, I think so. Right, carry on. Thank you. Uh, regarding the Perry Road project, which is the former Lister House Health Centre, what is the timescale? What procurement route is being pursued? What type of construction contract will be used? And whether it is a one or two stage tender? Do we have um, a reply from another councillor to this question? We do, Chair. I'm taking that reply. Thank you, Councillor Ingle. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Councillor Hardware. In uh, Councillor Durkin's absence, I, I will answer. It's expected that the it is expected that the start on site at Perry Road will be July 2021 with a two to two and a half year build programme. The council's internal procurement service is being used and the most effective route is currently being reviewed. It is anticipated that it will be a one stage tender. Councillor Hardware, do you have a supplementary? I do, yes. Okay. So with, with the provisions of the Public Services Social Value Act, which was passed in 2012, uh, and there also there was a, a Cabinet Office procurement notice issued earlier this year, 
Can the portfolio holder confirm what provision the council is specifying in the tender to maximise sustainability of the building and the construction process? What requirements for the use of a supply chain and what local skills and training provisions there are within the tender? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor Hardware. Um, as soon as the uh, councillor, the portfolio holder for growth and prosperity returns, I'll get him to write an answer to you. Thank you much, Councillor Ingle. Um, another question from Councillor Hardware. This is to Councillor Mark Ingle. Thank you, question Chair. Question two. Uh, is, sorry, this is to Councillor Mark uh, Ingle. Is Harlow Council going to invest in the Harlow Investment Fund? As he will be aware, Essex County Council approved a five million investment at Cabinet earlier this month and at full council earlier this week. The final fund will be up to 50 million, which will facilitate the wider regeneration of the town centre, allowing the projects to be properly joined up instead of the current fragmented approach. And so is very important to the town. Councillor Mark Ingle. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hardware, for your question. A report regarding the Harlow Investment Fund will be taken to Cabinet in early 2021, seeking approval of a £5 million investment in the fund by Harlow Council. This date is in line with the majority of other potential investors to the fund. If all parties agree to investing, the fund will provide a major financial contribution to enable the regeneration of Harlow Town Centre. Councillor Hardware, do you have a supplementary? Uh, just a little one. Can uh, uh, <laughs> Councillor Ingle ensure that it actually appears on the Cabinet Forward Plan? Because it's not there, uh, and this strikes me as a bit last minute, and uh, this is the reason for my question. Councillor um, Ingle? I can assure you it will be uh, brought to Cabinet and uh, it will be on uh, the Forward Plan, yes. OK. Councillor um, Simon Carter wants to ask a question of Councillor Mark Wilkinson. Councillor Carter. Thank you, Chair. Um, last week at Cabinet, uh, you said that in response to your plan to acquire 45 three-bed houses, so far the Council have completed the purchase of only one. You went on to say that you were extending your search to include two bed houses and flats, suggesting that you were struggling to find enough properties. What are the penalties if you fail to acquire sufficient properties by the 31st of December this year and 31st of March 2021? Reply from Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Chair. And again, uh, thank you to Councillor Carter for his question. My response. The penalty for not acquiring properties on or before the 31st of December is that the Conservative-led government will insist on taking pulled receipts totaling 2.232 million and would take 291,000 in interest payments. In addition to, to date, five purchases are progressing to completion and a further 24 offers have been accepted and are progressing through the purchasing process with completion expected prior to Christmas. If all were to be completed, then no funds would be re returned. If the required properties are not purchased in the first quarter of 2021, then up to a, a further 1.554 million would be returned with interest penalties of 202,000. Offers have already been made on 19 properties and it is currently expected that no funding will be returned nor penalties incurred in relation to pulled receipts. The council made representations to the government to extend the 31st of December deadline in light of COVID crisis. But this request was not agreed by MHCLG. Councillor Carr, have you got a supplementary? I do, Chair, thank you. Uh, it's not the government taking the receipts. It is the council which has failed to arrange to invest its money over a three-year period. Having lost £3.5 million previously, has the administration... Uh, uh, your question is... 
you, Councillor Wilkinson. Having lost three and a half million pounds previously, has the administration learned nothing about planning to spend, invest in council housing? Thank you, Councillor Carter. Councillor Wilkinson. Yeah, thank you. And again, not for the first time, I, 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 I really appreciate that the Conservative group are now suddenly concerned about council housing. Um, Councillor Carter and his group are well aware of the reasons why we didn't take the three and a half million pounds and fund the extra funding that we've had to find to uh, go along with that funding. We have moved massively in trying to create council housing. Indeed, in, under the Conservative administration, ill-fated administration, 2008 to 2012, they failed to deliver one single council premises in this town. We delivered 35 not so long ago, we have purchased 45, or hoping to purchase 45 that will be returned to uh, council housing soon. And we have created a housing and regeneration company for the purpose of bringing on more much needed social housing to this town. So we have learned quite a lot to answer your question and we have learned from your lessons of providing none. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Okay. That's finished with the questions. We now come on to item eight, motion from councillors. Um, now, councillor Emma Toole can't be with us tonight. So a proposal has been put forward that we defer this um, motion until the January full council. Would that be agreed with members of the council? Agreed. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so that means we now go on to item nine, referencing cabinet and committees. Item A is a referral from independent remuneration panel, and the report of that panel is found on pages 18 to 20. Um, I believe it's going to be moved um, by Councillor Mark Ingle and seconded um, yeah. by Andrew Johnson, and they both want to speak on it. So, Councillor Ing Ingle. Uh, very quickly, Chair, thank you. Um, the Independent Remuneration Panel, in view of the COVID crisis and the pressures on um, public finances and on people's wages in the private sector, recommended that um, councillor allowances and special responsibility allowances for 2021 to 2022 should remain unchanged. Um, the Labour Group agrees with that. Um, we feel very strongly that we should take, we should recognise what the independent remuneration panel um, say, and we should adopt their proposals. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ingle. And Councillor Johnson. Yes, Chair, I'm very happy to second this tonight. It's not often you get a uh, any item proposed by the leader and seconded by the leader of the opposition but I think it's important that the public hear what we're saying tonight and that is we agree with the independent remuneration panel um, well thank them for their work uh, thank them for looking sensitively at the public finances situation at the moment with COVID and we know how much a number of members of our public around the town are struggling at the moment financially it would not be appropriate for members allowances to be changed uh, I know I say that often even when we're not in a COVID crisis but I think particularly at the moment chair it's very important that we listen to them and that's why I'm happy to second this motion tonight. Thank you very much um, is that agreed by the members of the full council? Agreed. 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 Right now, um, we're going to go on to B and C, and we so need move, to... Chair. And I, I second that, Chair. Thank you. Um, and can I take these two together and um, have the, um, if anyone's got any objections, um, we'll have to do the vote, but if not, we can put these two, two up together as B and C. Is that agreed? Agreed. 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 Yeah. Okay. Councillor Ingle. No, that was me agreeing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right, you had your hand up. Right, okay. So we finished with item nine. Now we're on to item 10, report from officers. Um, the way we're going to do this item is that Count Officer Andrew Bramage is going to do a presentation. And when he's done that presentation, anyone that's got technical questions can ask him of those questions. And then... Councillor Danny Purton um, is going to um, move the, um, the local development plan 
and will be seconded by Councillor Mark Ingle, and we will go into the um, debate then. So, um, Officer Andrew Bamage, if you can start this item off. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report sets out the independent inspector's final comments on the Harlow local plan following the consultation on the main modifications that had been proposed by him. Uh, the inspector's report concludes with his assertion that the council is now free to adopt the plan and he has found it fully compliant with national policy. I'm not going to take members through the detail of the local plan as that has been debated and agreed by councillors before. This report is concerned with the final modifications to that plan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I thought it's just worth refreshing members on, on the timetable that, that this has been through. Um, over six years of work has, has led to this point. And although, in fact, you could go back to 2007 with the work that was done then on the um, East of England plan and, and the, the, the initial version of, of, of a new development plan for Harlow. Uh, but a number of stages, particularly in the last six years, have been, have been achieved to, to get to where we are today. Next slide, please. Uh, I think it's also worth reminding everybody that the council has set itself a very aspirational vision, and they did this, you know, and, and I would invite members and members of the public to, to look uh, in the final version of the local plan when that's published uh, following this meeting at the uh, vision section of the documents because it does set out a very aspirational vision for our town. Uh, it is Often that we you know we focus on housing numbers and 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 sites, but actually the plan is concerned with the future of the town and what sort of town we think Harlow should be in the next decade and and beyond. And and the vision that that's set out here um, emphasizes that across a whole range of of fields. Next slide, please. The Harlow local development plan will set out the planning strategy to deliver that vision for the next 13 years. Uh, it, it provides the planning framework, it identifies the sites to meet our housing and employment need and the infrastructure to support that. It also, as has been mentioned earlier in this meeting, will do a, a huge amount to protect the town's environmental assets and particularly the, the, the network of green wedges and green fingers. It will also set out a range of development management policies and from the adoption of this plan, all new planning applications coming to this council will be assessed by the new policies within this plan. Next slide, please. Uh, this, I'm not gonna go into the detail of this, um, but, but, but this plan which um, we sent councillors an A3 version of, of, of the plan last week uh, and, and you'll, you'll see the final version published um, very shortly but this uh, in diagrammatic form sets out the, the proposals for, for the lifetime of the local plan. The sort of mauve areas are the employment sites, the brown areas are, are, are the new housing locations and you'll see the um, the network of green spaces which, which has been extended and I'll say a bit more about that in, in a minute. Uh, next slides, please. So on to the inspector's report. His, his first requirement was to assess that the council had met its legal obligations. He has found that the council has uh, engaged uh, positively with its neighbours and, and has fully met the duty to cooperate that the that, that government has required us to, to comply with. In particular, he's noted that we um, ha have achieved the, the development of memorandums of understanding with our neighbouring authorities on, on a range of issues, particularly on the four listed there, highways, the Epping Forest area of conservation, the distribution of housing growth and employment growth. He has also found that we have fully met the legal compliance tests required by government, uh, particularly in relation to um, sustainability and, and, and habitats regulation, which, which has ha had to be updated recently. Next slide, please. He then focused on housing provision and he has accepted the council's proposals to uh, set a target to build 10,620 new homes in the planned period. 
I should emphasize here, the plan period actually started in 2011. Um, so obviously a lot of those homes have already been built. Um, and the, he's accepted the arguments around a, a requirement to deliver housing over and above the objectively assessed housing need uh, to ensure that the council fulfills its regeneration objectives and can deliver the amount of affordable housing that the town requires. He's also accepted um, uh, what, what may seem a technical point about the, what we call the stepped trajectory. So rather than having a flat profile of housing to be delivered over the remainder of the plan, he accepts that because of the strategic site to the east of Harlow is a longer term development, inevitably there will be a lower rate in the early years and a higher rate um, in later years of the plan as that site comes forward. Next slide, please. He has agreed to the proposals to um, amend the green belt and, and in particular to, to release the, the green belt site for the strategic site to the east of Harlow. There are a number of minor changes to, to green belt boundaries as, are, as set out in the report and in the main modifications schedule. Um, but, but overall, um, the, the inspectors concluded that the plan now provides robust defendable boundaries for the green belts around Harlow. Next slide, please. Um, I've always, already mentioned the strategic site to the east of Harlow, which the, the, the inspector has found uh, to, to meet the town's uh, growing housing needs and, and a requirement for the future. He's also found that the garden community's policies are, are sound and given the, council, the, given the town's location in the London Stansted Cambridge corridor, the, the obvious location for growth is around Harlow Gilston. The strategic site to the east of Harlow is supported and I should here um, inform members that we learned earlier this week that the promoter of that site, Miller Homes, have decided not to renew their um, option to develop that site uh, and that the landowner consortium um, have also talked to us this week, uh, the, the landowners who, who own that land to the east of Harlow, and reaffirmed their intention to bring that site forward for development. They have appointed an agent to help them do that and select a new development partner who they hope will be in place by the spring of next year. Um, they've retained the planning consultants that Miller Homes um, had previously engaged and have also had the benefit of all of the work that Miller Homes have done over the previous decade or so actually, in terms of outline master planning and technical studies that will be available to them. So although there will be a change of developer for that site, um, we do not believe that will have any change, any material change to the deliverability of the site uh, as a new development partner will be on board by the spring of next year and Harlow Council will work proactively with them to, to bring that site forward during the lifetime of this plan. Next slide, please. Um, also on housing, um, members will be aware that some of the smaller sites were deleted by the inspector at an earlier phase in this process. This just lists the remaining um, sites that are uh, outside of the strategic site, um, an additional 834 dwellings. And the next slide, please, identifies the, the distribution of those across the town. And next slide, please, Adam. Uh, I'd also draw members' attention to the economic policies that the inspector has supported, uh, and, and uh, I think this is particularly in, important and that the town has um, several times in recent years been um, subject to uh, developer requests to uh, bring forward sites for warehousing, logistics development, um, which we have tried to resist in favour of higher value uses and the inspector has fully supported our allocation of land for research and development activities um, and, and, and higher value office uses and, and, and that will stand the town in good stead, stead for having a broader range of employment types for the future. And next slide please. Um, environmental policies have already been mentioned. The, uh, the, the 
the green wedge and green finger network is now in, fully enshrined in the council's planning policy and, and will be protected for the lifetime of this plan. There are new green finger designations at the new Golden Park development and the strategic housing sites to the east of Harlow will see a new green wedge formalized through that site. Uh, and, and there are new policies that the council will be implementing to work with our neighbours to support um, sites of uh, importance such as Epping Forest and Hatfield Forest. Next slide please. And then just to conclude with a couple of slides on the development management policies in the in the local plan that the inspector has, has made a number of modifications to but has, has supported um, the, the, the thrust of the policies. Uh, I just on this slide particularly pick out the houses in multiple occupation policy and the inspector's re requirements for the council to undertake a review after two years following the adoption of this plan as to the effectiveness of that policy. That policy um, is tightening the, uh, the, the council's control over the future development of large HMOs and particular requirements around parking standards um, and the numbers of HMOs in particular localities. Uh, but the inspectors asked to review that policy um, two years from the adoption of this plan. And next slide, please. Final slide. Um, the other uh, development management policies that the inspector has, has um, highlighted are also in more detail is set out in the report. But again, I just wanted to highlight here a new policy that, that we have in, in the plan on health and well-being. Previously, a number of health and well-being policies were pepper potted throughout the plan. The inspector felt that that was better identified as a single new policy to highlight the importance of that um, in considering planning applications. And, and, and so that will now be enshrined in our new local plan. So in, uh, in, in, in summary, the inspector, having undertaken the examination in uh, 20, uh, spring of, of, of 2019 has now concluded that following the modifications he has proposed that the plan meets the legal tests is, is sound in, in national planning policy terms and that the council is, is free to adopt the plan. So members are now asked to approve the recommendations as set out in paragraphs A to F at the front of this report. Thank you. Andrew. Um, now can I um, ask um, members if they've got any technical questions to um, bring them forward? Thank you. Councillor Hardware, I've seen your hand come up. And then Councillor Ingle. So Councillor Hardware. Apologies, Chair. Could I ask that all councillors use the hands up function, please? Yes. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank um, you. Yeah, can I just say, when it comes down to using the hands up function, um, my screen won't allow me to do that. It's fully uh, the book. Oh, it's come up now. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> OK, right. Councillor Hardware, I've seen your hand come up. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. I, I actually have three questions. Do you want me to read out all three or shall we do yep. them individually? No. Do the, do the three. Okay. Uh, my first question concerns um, uh, uh, the numbers. Uh, there are sig uh, significant numbers of new homes coming forward in the town centre, which do not appear to be catered for in the local plan. Can the council explain what impacts these um, new developments will have on the local plan? And does it mean that we're actually going to build or have more than the 9,000 houses built in Harley? The second question, uh, relates to uh, the five-year land supply, which um, uh, was mentioned just mentioned in that in that um, presentation. Uh, if we adopt this local plan and for it to remain valid, the council has to maintain a five-year land supply, as it has been some time, probably a year, since the local plan was last discussed. What is the current five-year land supply figure for the council? And my third question: 
which is a similar question, but is at the other end of the supply chain. Similarly, with housing delivery, if the council fails to deliver the required number of houses each year, and it's on a three-year rolling total, I understand, again, the local plan becomes invalid. So what are the council's projections for 2020 and 2021? Thank you, Councillor Hardware. Andrew, can you reply to those questions, please? Yeah, so on the, the first question, the new developments coming forward in the town centre are outside of the scope of the plan in that they have not been identified as new housing sites. So they are in effect windfall sites that the, the council benefits from. And, and the inspector has made reference to that in, in his report. Um, and that really provides some um, protection, I guess, some insurance for the council if other sites do not come forward, um, as you know, clearly may well happen over the next 13 years, um, or some sites take longer to come forward, and then that, the windfall sites will give the council some flexibility and still the ability to meet our, our rolling targets to, to government. Uh, and as to the second question, uh, five-year land supply. The current um, land supply we have at the moment is, is six years uh, in, in terms of identified and allocated sites and, and the inspector himself has um, uh, identified that calculation uh, in, in his report. Um, in terms of the details for delivery for 2020 and 2021, I will have to uh, come back to Councillor Hardware in writing a meeting to provide him with the accurate figures so that I don't have those to hand. Okay. Councillor Ingle. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Andrew, the requirement to uh, produce a local plan is a government requirement and um, all, this, all councils have to produce one. Um, I'm aware that our good neighbours, East Hearts, have adopted their local plan. I wonder if you could give us a, an update on how our other neighbours are doing in terms of their local plans and what the consequence would be for a council if they were failed, if they failed to um, adopt a local plan. Thank you. Uh, so, Councillor Ingle, the, yes, as you say, East Hertfordshire um, have already adopted their plan that happened um, towards the end of 2018. Epping Forest District Council are nearing the end of their local plan process and they are hoping to agree the uh, or, or to go out to consultation on the main modifications to their plan early in the new year and they're in the process of discussing those with their inspector and, and certainly Epping Forest um, have expectations of being able to adopt their plan during the course of 2021. Um, the other authority in the strategic housing market area that, that we sit within is, is Uttlesford and uh, members may well be aware that th that has um, been subject to, to uh, some difficulties in, in recent months and in fact the Uttlesford District Council have agreed to withdraw their plan and effectively to start again. Um, which will take them back several years um, uh, in, in the development of their plan. In, in terms of potential um, penalties, um, if, we, if a plan is not adopted, then um, the Secretary of State could direct um, a plan to be adopted and take it out of the Council's hands, or um, in the case of Uttlesford, uh, required to, to, to effectively start again, that which would be at huge cost and expense to, to the local authority. Thank you. Lisa? Uh, um, Councillor Joel Charles. Thank you, Chair. I have two questions. Do you want me to read both of them at the same time for answers from Andrew? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. My first question relates to page 32, paragraph 69 which is a comment from the inspector that no heritage impact assessment was undertaken for the East of Harlow strategic housing site. Given the historical nature of Old Harlow, which is impacted by this uh, proposed strategic site, why was that separate heritage impact assessment not taken in advance of the process for this local plan? My second question relates to page 34, 
paragraph 78, the playground west of 93 and 100 Jocelyn's. At any stage during this process, did Harlow Council ever support recommendations from residents and the old Harlow Conservative councillors to protect Jocelyn's playing field as green wedge, although we welcome the fact that no houses will be built there under the planning process set out today. Uh, in answer to the first question, the inspector has, uh, th through the examination, uh, identified that the appropriate time for the heritage impact assessment is to be undertaken during the master planning phase for that site. Um, he particularly drew attention to the important heritage assets in, in that location. Um, and the um, memorandum of understanding that the council has agreed with Historic England requires that there will be uh, a, a heritage assessment of that site as, as the master planning of that site comes forward. Um, it is probably only when there are clearer development proposals through the master planning stage that the heritage impact um, of that development could be assessed. Uh, uh, to do it at this stage would, could only mean that it would be at a very high level. So uh, I can assure Councillor Charles that that will be um, accounted for um, as the master planning proposals come forward over the next two to three years for, for that site. Uh, and as to the second question, um, the, uh, there was a proposal put forward, um, as Councillor Charles has indicated, uh, to the inspector to retain that site as Green Wedge. Um, and the, all the responses that we received as part of the consultation were forwarded to the inspector, but the inspector himself concluded that he did not wish to see that site retained as Green Wedge, and, and that was his decision. Okay, thank you. Lisa? There's no further questions from councillors. Okay, right, okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for your um, technical logical um, answering and the um, presentation that you've given us. Now we come on to item A and Councillor Purton, um, this is your chance to have the five minutes that um, towards the um, local development plan package that um, you wanted to talk about. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I just think you need to just confirm that Councillor Purton is moving the report before you start the debate. Oh, right, are you moving the report, Councillor Burton? I am, I, I'm moving the report, uh, agenda item 10A. Thank and you. Chair, I'm seconding that um, agenda item 10A, but I will reserve my right to speak. I was just gonna ask you that. Thank you very much, Councillor Ingle. Okay, Councillor Burton. Right, thank you. Well, first of all, I, I thank uh, Andrew for presenting the, the technical factual uh, parts of the of the uh, report. Um, so it's for me to outline the, what we're actually going, I'm hoping we're going to agree this evening in, in procedural terms. <clears throat> this report uh, is marks the final conclusion of a very lengthy process involving many hours of meetings and hearings. To take you through the recommendations, which are on page, uh, well, are in fact on the front page of item 10A. Uh, item A considers the inspector's final report. And in some ways we, we've just done that by uh, Andrew's presentation. Item B, <clears throat> ask the council to adopt the local development plan, uh, appendix two, including the modifications, uh, appendix three and four. Item C, ask the council to adopt the policies map, which is appendix five. And uh, as uh, Andrew's already mentioned, all members have been sent a A3 size hard copy Item D uh, asks us to revoke the previous local development plan, which was uh, last agreed in July 2009. Item E notes the various accompanying statements 
which are at Appendix 6 and Appendix 7. And Item F delegates authority to Andrew Bramage, myself, and the Chair of the Local Development Plan panel to agree any minor alterations or typos which may be found in the plan. The background, uh, which I'll briefly touch on some uh, main points. As has already been emphasised, this isn't something we do just because we like doing things. It's re a requirement of the law, as was changed um, uh, from 2010. <clears throat> it will, when adopted, will provide the planning framework against which the council will consider and determine planning applications. Now that sounds a very short statement, but of course it's got huge implications because we now have, uh, or will have, a local plan which uh, addresses every sort of issue, including some issues that weren't there before. In other words, it's not just an update. Also, uh, in item three, it makes it clear that the plan provides a framework to reinforce the objectives and vision of the Harlow and Gilston Garden Town, in which we have played a very uh, prominent role. And we see the Garden Town as the future for Harlow. Arising from the examination in public in spring 2019, that was pre-Zoom, we actually have met face to face. Um, I'd like to, and first of all, I'd like to thank all of those who made formal representations. Uh, surprisingly, the MP or, or neither the MP nor the Tory group did actually make any formal representations, which is uh, quite a surprise. Uh, and following instructions from David Reed, the planning inspector, we undertook public consultation on the main modifications, including other assessments. And these main modifications, to gain another technical word, it's changes that, uh, of significance that the inspector wanted us to make. We don't get any choice in that. Uh, we have to carry out the inspector's instructions. And we undertook public consultation on on those in March, April and May 2020. And after considering uh, those, uh, the, the results of that public consultation on the main modifications and a further discussion about the uh, housing numbers, we finally, on the 5th of November, got the green light. The plan is sound. I know that sounds like a hip statement, but because it's a very technical statement, uh, that's what we've been trying to prove over the last 10 years, that we have a sound plan. Apologies, Councillor. So in conclusion, I'd like, to, yeah, I'd like to thank the panel members. I'd like to pay tribute to Andrew Bramage and Paul McBride and all the forward planning team for their dedication and apologise for occasionally giving them a hard time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Purton. Um, I now open it up for comments from any councillors on the local plan. Oh, I've got to put the right to. Uh, uh, Councillor Michael Hardware, Chair. Councillor Hardware. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> I was raising my hand for. <laughs> I forgot I needed to push the button, but uh, I didn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's get confusing. <laughs> <laughs> we have before us an approved local plan. It has been a long journey to get to this point. Um, I think I've heard 10 years quoted by Danny, six years quoted by uh, Andrew, but whatever it is, a long journey. It's a journey that's not been without its stumbles and mishaps. We started many years ago with cross-party agreement that we needed to provide housing for Harlow residents. We still do agree on that point. But problems started 
with the wider area, not really the lo Harlow local plan. It began with the council changing its mind about the developments around Harlow. We had cross-party agreement that we would not support developments south and west of the town would focus on the north. But then the council signed up to the garden town, which encompassed all those developments, so had to, embarrassingly, hold a separate full council meeting to change the objection to the developments to the south and west of Harlow into support, a full U-turn. Then we come to the local plan before us tonight for adoption. We have consistently opposed this local plan for various different reasons, some of which such as the ingress into the green belt and the green wedges going against the Gibbard principles. The consultation at every stage of this local plan process has been woefully inadequate. From recollection, Reg 18 consultation only received 126 responses and the Reg 19 consultation around about 70. I hear some say that perhaps residents were not concerned about the local plan. I would certainly disagree. Harlow residents are very concerned about their time, uh, town, but how can they have a view on something they do not know is going on or did not know was going on? Our neighbours in Epping Forest, and in fact in East Hearts, undertook comprehensive public engagement programmes for both Reg 18 and Reg 19 consultations. For Epping Forest, they received 3,000 and 1,000 responses respectively. I know it's a bigger district, but it's still a much better response. And there are the numbers. Only a few months ago, the inspector wrote to the council, inviting it to provide comments on the fact that the new housing need figures for Harlow were reduced to around just over 7,000 from 9,200. The council decided that it did not want to reduce the numbers and said that it wanted to maintain the contribution of social housing. But we appear to be building more houses than we actually need. And this has been further highlighted by Andy Barrett's comments about the uh, the uh, over a thousand, probably thousand apartments that are going to appear in the town centre, which is going to be over and above the 9,000 if it all comes forward. At the last council, uh, full council, I asked the portfolio holder whether he understood the difference between affordable and social housing, but did not receive a satisfactory answer. The local plan will provide affordable and intermediate affordable housing, not social housing. So in conclusion, broadly, the Conservative group are not happy with the numbers, we're not happy with the process, we're not happy with the consultation, we're not happy that uh, uh, the Labour group changed its mind and broke the agreement, and we're not happy with the ingress into the Green Belt and the Green Wedges, so we will be opposing this tonight. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Lisa? Councillor Michael Danvers. Are you calling me, Chair? Sorry. Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, thank you, Chair. So um, well, one wouldn't think that we've got a housing crisis uh, to listen to Michael Hardware. Um, we have got a housing crisis. We've got 4,000 people um, on our waiting list. And to actually uh, say that <laughs> we're, we're, we're not actually uh, worried about how many houses are on the list is ridiculous. Um, the whole country is crying out for decent housing. Um, in my belief, it should actually be housing for rent uh, as well, and in particular, uh, council housing. Uh, this government doesn't give much credence to council housing, unfortunately, but this authority does. And at the end of the day, if we need social housing and we need proper rented accommodation, then we actually have to, unfortunately, envisage numbers of, of this magnitude because the Tories simply want houses for, for sale all of the time. Um, so at the end of the day, the local plan has gone through uh, a long, long process. There's been full consultation. In fact, um, one of the groups that's been formed, the Alliance Party, hats off to them. They have fully participated all the way through and have made very valid comments about Harlow Council's, uh, Harlow Labour Council's uh, proposals. Um, and also I'd like, if thanks are being dished out, 
to, to Danny because Danny has actually worked really, really hard on this uh, for the last few years. And he too has been to be congratulated in terms of actually achieving something that clearly our neighbouring authorities have not been able to do. And with Adelsford, in fact, it's been back to the drawing board. So well done, Danny, and well done, the team. And I think we've got a very creditable document tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Danvers. Councillor Russell Perry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to echo um, uh, what Councillor Michael Hardware said, uh, and particularly on the numbers. Um, it's interesting that Councillor Danvers attacked him for not understanding there's a housing crisis by quoting that there are 4,000 on our waiting list when the inspector has already said that in this plan there are too many houses and that there are over 9,000 being made. For whatever reason, uh, I hope you never become the portfolio holder for resources with such a weak grasp on numbers like that. Oh, you are. Um, following on from that, uh, for over a decade, both myself, my ward colleagues, the Conservative group and many residents, particularly those in Sumners and Kingsmore, Catherine's uh, and the like, have been campaigning against development to South West of Harlow and they've been ignored. We are not happy with the overinflated numbers that are in this plan. We're not happy with the lack of public consultation over where housing sites are going. We're not happy with the development or, or lack of, of infrastructure and the balmy, balmy ideas that have been put forward uh, that we've heard recently this week. We're not happy the fact that you all tore up the cross-party agreement on no development. We're not happy with the roughshod way in which you've ride, ridden over uh, both us as a, as a, as a cross-party uh, group that we had on this. We're not happy with the way you've ignored residents' wishes on this. The lack of consultation has been woefully poor and, and the whole process is, is an absolute farce. It's, it's a bad thing and uh, I'm not happy and I won't be voting for it. I won't be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Councillor Simon Carter, Chair. Councillor Carter. <clears throat> I'm waiting to be unmuted. Can you hear me? Oh, there yep. we go. Yeah. Yep, you can <clears throat> hear you. Thank you, Chair. Um, <laughs> I was never sure I'd actually see this day with the uh, plan to be finally formally adopted. Having followed it for what Andrew described as six years on the local development plan panel, with all the delays and changes to the numbers and the rules, it has been quite an effort. So, uh, as Councillor Purton has done, I, I must congratulate the planning team for their patience, pers persistence and professionalism in producing it. Behind this plan tonight, there is a whole library of research and reports to support the recommendation from the Great Nested Newt Study Report to the Harley Regeneration Strategy Analysis of Needs. Uh, if anybody has nothing to do over Christmas, I can thoroughly recommend dipping into that library. <clears throat> Overall, the plan is an exciting document, laying out the growth and regeneration for a, a vibrant future for, for Harlow, including, I have to say, I, I was particularly impressed with the concept of green fingers to help uh, prevent uh, inappropriate developments. So it was with deep disappointment that with all that research and preparation that the people of Harlow were denied the opportunity of seeing what the plan was about. It's somewhat hypocritical of the administration to complain about the lack of public engagement in the planning white paper when they themselves did the very same thing to their own plan. At least they could speak from experience. And getting a little weary of these comments that uh, we are opposed to council housing. We've made it perfectly clear over very many years that we support more council housing. And those of you with slightly better memories will recall two years ago and the budget we actually proposed uh, investing in one or two sites to actually build council houses. So I, <clears throat> I'd be grateful if uh, people could actually take that on board and actually uh, reflect the truth. The plan, of course, isn't perfect, as my colleagues have amply explained already. 
It's a huge document with lots of detail as well as the overarching policies. And I'm sure we can all find something we don't like. From my point of view, I was pleased to see in policy H5, accessible and adaptable housing, that all new dwellings should be at least building regulations part M42 standard for accessible and adaptable homes. <clears throat> I was less than pleased when the inspector downgraded the requirement for part M43 for wheelchair friendly homes to be subject to affordability. That affordability is made more difficult by power 1318, sustainable design, construction and energy use, where developments will be encouraged where minimum standards for insulation are exceeded, are exceeded by 19%, giving developers a discretionary opt out of providing wheelchair homes. I'm pretty clear on what kind of message that is sending out to the disabled. That is not the only reason I, can, uh, I can't support the plan tonight. There are other issues described by my colleagues, but it does make it easier to vote against it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Carter. <clears throat> Lisa? Councillor Eugenie Harvey, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Harvey? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, make a quick point, um, and that's really for anybody watching this debate. Um, and, you know, it's, of course, hardly surprising that the opposition would oppose this. The clue is in the title. Um, and I think Councillor Carter makes a valid point that I'm sure we could all go through this and find things that we were, wish were different. You know, a document of this size, of this ambition, is never going to be perfect for everybody. So I guess we're agreed at least that we are in the um, area of compromise to an extent. But what I think it's really important that people understand is that this document has been through a rigorous independent external review. <laughs> so it is not the Labor Administration or the Council forcing this document upon our town. This is a document we have pr produced based on what we believe is an ambitious and visionary and caring and compassionate um, town, future for our town. Um, which an external inspector has been charged with picking holes in, looking for flaws, questioning the level of consultation, challenging um, assumptions. And that process is rigorous and lengthy and the officer hours that have gone into it are almost unthinkable over the years. Um, and I think people really need to appreciate that this is not a political act. This is an act of uh, great diligence and thoroughness and rigor and independence. And so, yes, of course, the opposition is going to disagree with it. Um, and as Councillor Carter has said, quite likely we could all disagree with it at, in different points. But the fact of the matter is we are presenting to this town something which other authorities have not yet been able to achieve. And it is a great credit to the officers for what nearly a decade that we have got to this point. And I really want to recognize that. And I hope that the public understands that we'll all be throwing toys out of the pram if we expect everything that happens to us to be absolutely perfect. But this is a thorough, good document which we should be deeply proud of and satisfied with and I thank again the officers for their hard work. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Councillor Charles, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Charles. Thank you, Chair. Before I begin my remarks, I'd like to pay tribute to an officer who should have been uh, recognised right at the start of this uh, agenda item, and that is Graham Bloomer, who spent years as a dedicated public servant to Harlow and should be recognised tonight for his work and dedication to the town. Uh, although I don't agree with Labour's local plan, I recognise his public service and the hours that he put in for the town and that should be recognised and I hope the administration does that. This local plan lacked consultation all the way through. I've engaged in the process, contrary to what 
some of the Labour members have said tonight. I've written my views very strongly in defence of Old Harlow, the ward that I represent, alongside Councillor Mike Garnett and Councillor Sue Livings. We are deeply concerned about the strategic site to the east of Harlow and the projection of 2,600 dwellings. Now, despite what the planning inspector has said around a stepped trajectory, and he can make all kinds of planning assumptions associated with that strategic housing site, to me, the arguments do not stack up. I'm also concerned that this council has failed to recognise the historical character of Old Harlow. We should have had an indicative heritage impact assessment from the beginning because everyone recognises the special character of Old Harlow and its needs. Attempting to scale development, irrespective of a phased approach, will be a hammer blow to the Old Harlow community. Labour are letting down Old Harlow and they know that. They know that because as we know, the objective housing need assessment put the amount of houses required in this local planning process up to 2033 at around 7,400 dwellings. But this administration wants 9,200. They had room to manoeuvre, to sympathetically recognise the arguments that have been put by Old Harlow residents, but they chose to ignore them, to pursue their dream of overdevelopment. There are some positives that we must recognise for the future of our town. And that of course is the new Harlow Hospital, addressing the future health and care needs of our community. And I welcome the process to deliver that. And that's a key piece of infrastructure for our future and our future needs as a community. And I welcome the investment from the government on that front. What I don't agree with is a process to focus purely on vanity projects when it comes to the sustainable transport corridors that are a focus of this plan. Yes, we should think about sustainable transport, but in a way that is measured, that is based on facts, that is not rushed, so that we get the very best transport routes for our town, not some monorail that's just been cooked up on the back of a piece of paper and no real feasibility or understanding of the indicative costs. Yes, this council wants to pursue a feasibility study, but it doesn't truly understand the undertaking it will need to pursue in this vanity project. My concerns also stretch to some of the wider impacts in Old Harlow. For example, Jocelyn's Park. Jocelyn's Park, as residents will tell anyone, is an important part of the green community in our town. Generations of young people have played football or used the swings when they were there. It's an important green space and I welcome the fact that the inspector has said that there should be no houses on that green space but it should have further protection as part of the green wedge and I'm disappointed that the council didn't fight hard enough to protect it. There's a huge amount of pressure on hold Old Harlow at the moment with the prospect of the strategic housing site to the east, further development at Newhall and of course the Gildan Park development. We need to think more sympathetically about our communities when we adopt these local plans. Labour is trying to railroad this process and attack established communities and I for one will be voting against it. Thank you Councillor Charles. Any more councillors Lisa? Um, Councillor Tony Edwards. Yeah. Councillor Edwards. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Yep. I find the hypocrisy of the Tories well, breathtaking, really. And let's just put this into some context. First of all, we have a government that says within the southeast area that so many thousand houses have to be built. Then it then it also puts upon that local government or those local organisations, the local uh, councils, the duty to cooperate. It also then puts it in, in a local context. It puts on East Hearts the duty to build so many thousand houses. It puts on Epping Forest the duty to build so many thousand houses. It puts on Harlow the duty to build 
70,000 houses. The complication that it also adds as far as Harlow is concerned is that we know we have not got enough social housing provision in this town. And the only way you're going to get social housing provision in this town is either for the government to change its policies and allow and, and to actively, actively physically invest in the building of council housing, not for sale council housing, and to do away with the, the, the nonsense that we've got at the moment, whereby whilst on the one hand we're, we're trying to build council housing, on the other hand we have to sell the council housing that we are building. So first of all, the, the hypocrisy within the government is, as I say, breathtaking. And then, <clears throat> and then on top of that, so we, so we have we have the, we have a, a situation whereby we're required to build some, some uh, we're, we're required to build housing, we're re, we're required to cooperate. We then have put on top of that that the way through that is to is to do the Gilston Harlow Garden Town development and to embrace that, which is what this local plan attempts to do in its in its broadest sense. And bring um, 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 to, and to attempt to bring together some coherence. Yes, of course, none of us, particularly, I mean, in terms of whether it be impact upon old Harlow, whether it be impact upon other bits of the town, of course, there are bits in, in, in within this, that were, or the impact in terms of the self, which, which we can all look at and say, no, we wouldn't want that. In an ideal world, we may not want these things, we may not want these things. On the other hand, what we are, what and what this plan is attempting to do, is to wrestle with some, where uh, to wrestle with the difficulties that we're faced by by, by, poli by centrally driven policies. So we 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 have either in terms of the in terms of the garden town, either we had to do that duty to co cooperate. If we hadn't have done that duty to cooperate, the government would have done it for us. Make no bones about that. So in terms of in terms of this uh, local plan, I would have hoped, because it is a sound local local plan, as uh, uh, Councillor Eugenie has said, the, you know, the, the planning inspector has he's looked at it, he said it is a sound plan. I would have hoped that on the basis of that, that whilst we may all have our various political, dif uh, political differences, but given the amount of work that the officers have put in here, given that we've now got a planning inspector who says it's a, plan, a sound plan, that we could have all rallied around it and said, well, OK, this is the plan that we have, that has been devised over these last, the last few years. We've all had the opportunity, political parties of all sides have had the opportunity to put in their two penneth worth and to influence this plan. This is what we've now got. I would have hoped that we could have united behind it and taking it forward as the Harlow plan. But for political, but for it seems to me for purely party political purposes, the Tory party are, are, are positioning them to, themselves to say, oh no, this plan, oh no, nothing to do with us. Oh, we weren't, you know, so well, if that's, if that's the line that they want to take, then so be it. It just so it seems to me a real shame. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Any more councillors? Councillor Andrew Johnson. Hmm. Councillor Andrew Johnson. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to start by agreeing with Councillor Edwards. It is a real shame. It's a real shame when joint political working was on offer years ago and was achieved under former Labour leaders um, who sadly are no longer on the council. Um, John Klempner particularly was very keen to work closely with the opposition on the issue of the local plan. It's a real shame that that political cooperation was torn up by the administration, uh, was deemed no longer necessary. And it's a real shame that agreements about where housing growth should be, that all sides of the chamber, including Liberal Democrats who were then on the council, who rarely agreed to anything, um, had agreed to. Uh, were torn up. We had an agreement in this town that development should go to the north. It's one of the reasons I, su I supported the Gilston Garden Town when the original plan for that was to have growth to the north. By putting all the growth in the, uh, outside the boundaries of the town, 
by putting all of the growth to the north of the town, supporting communications links, supporting infrastructure links, and supporting tangible growth that could deliver benefits for the whole community of Harlow, rather than pepper potting small developments around the town, threatening our green wedges, threatening our green spaces, that was an agreement I could get behind. It's also a real shame, Chair, that the consultation has been so bungled on this, and it should not surprise anyone to hear us say that tonight, because for years now, the Conservative group has been calling for better consultation with the public over the plan. And you know what, Chair? It does work when you consult. As Mike Hardware has already mentioned tonight, thousands of residents engaged with our neighbours in Epping Forest. The, the, the portfolio holder may not like the Conservative administrations elsewhere, and I may not agree personally with everything they do, but they got their consultation on their local plan right, uh, and they made sure that the public were aware. Now, Chair, you've heard from my members tonight that we will not be supporting this and we will not because we do not support some of the things in this plan. But that doesn't mean we don't support all of the things in this plan. It is important, as has been stressed by councillors on both sides, to have the local plan to protect as many areas as possible from aggressive development. And I think things such as the hospital and the redevelopment of the hospital site in the local plan should be welcomed. But, Chair, the consultation has been poor. The decision by the administration to not follow the inspector's guidance to reduce the number of houses in the plan to 7,000 um, and instead to have a plan that delivers over 9,000 plus about 1,000 additional windfall homes within the town centre, over 10,000 homes potentially putting stress within the boundaries of Harlow. I think we all want to see as members Harlow homes for Harlow people and we want to see the ability for people not to be on our council waiting list, which is why, yes, Councillor Wilkinson, we have supported council housing over a number of years. I know the Labour Party in Harlow doesn't want to acknowledge that Harlow Tories are actually in favour of council housing, but repeatedly we have called to support council housing. And I'm more than happy to have any debate with him on council housing and with other Labour members, if so be. But Chair, we, we cannot support a plan that talks of over 10,000 houses being squeezed into Harlow's boundaries when the inspector says only 7,000 are necessary. And indeed, as Councillor Danvers has pointed out, there is only 4,000 need in Harlow at the moment on our waiting lists. Chair, the plan goes too far in some areas and the plan doesn't go far enough in others. This is not the plan that would have been delivered by a Conservative administration and I will not be voting for it, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Uh, Chair, on the point of order, uh, Councillor Johnson's named me. Could I just be quite clear in terms of the actual figures? The Tories insist on lots and lots and lots of houses for sale. They don't respect the idea of council housing in terms of numbers. And therefore, 4,000 people on our waiting list, unfortunately, would not be actually even maintained by the 9,000 that's actually in the local plan. Yes, I can add up, Councillor Perrin, and unfortunately it's your government that actually discriminate against social housing. Thank you, Councillor Danvers. Lisa, any more councillors? Councillor Mark Ingle. Councillor Mark Ingle. Thank you, Chair. Well, let me just come back on one or two of the things that I've heard here. Um, both Councillor Johnson and Councillor Perrin talk about 9,000 houses being too much to meet our council house uh, waiting list of nearly 5,000 now. Um, but of course, they're com they're, they're, I, don't, I don't know if it's a mistake on their part or deliberately trying to mislead, but they know or should know certainly that only 30% of um, developments are likely to be affordable or proper social rent. So if we're going to meet a need of 4,000, 9,000 isn't too many. It's probably not quite enough. And so, Councillor Perrin, you were rather rude to my comrade, Councillor Michael, Mike Danvers. 30% of 9,000 isn't too many to meet the housing, uh, uh, housing needs requirements of more than 4,000. Let's hope you never 
are put in the position of being the portfolio holder for resources for the Conservatives. Oh, you are. Now let's talk about um, some of the comments, <laughs> the rather bizarre comments that Councillor Charles makes. He says, he starts his comments saying, well, despite what the inspector said, there is no despite what the inspector said. <laughs> the inspector allows us to go forward with the plan or it doesn't. We live in the real world. Not some dream fantasy of Councillor Charles. Councillor yeah, Charles... Point of personal project. clarification. Right. Can we carry on? Yes. Councillor Charles objects to the lack of a heritage impact assessment. Chair. The area around... Point of personal clarification. The ruling's been made, Chair. Let's carry on, please. You've just allowed one of your Labour colleagues, may I make a point of clarification, Chair? Carry on. Thank you, Chair. I said my view is that I oppose the inspector's decision. And I can say, with all justification given my arguments, that I disagree with him. You and the Labour Party agree with him. That's your choice. Thank you. We're out of order, Councillor Charles. Right, can we focus on this local plan and can we not start quibbling around with the councillors, please? Councillor Ingle, can you carry on? But remember that we are supposed to be, we're being viewed by the public and we would like to have a good view from their point of view. Thank you. Absolutely, uh, Chair. Um, but I will reiterate the fact that Councillor Charles started by saying, despite the inspector's comments and that's a matter of record and we can't live in the world of despite the inspector's comments. He also went on to object to a lack of a heritage impact assessment in the area around Old Harlow even after the officer's presentation tonight which made clear that the inspector felt that the right time for that was to come later um, in this process. He wants to object even though he's been told that's the, uh, the the wrong time to be objecting about this. Councillor Charles goes on to talk a mon about a monorail. The monorail exists only in his head. Nobody's proposing a monorail. It's absolute fantasy. It's clear Councillor Joel, Joel Charles is manufacturing things to object to. He has nothing to offer. He has no vision, no ambition for his town. Oh, but then again, Councillor Charles thinks Harlow is a small town. We think Councillor Charles has small ambition for his town. Chair, this local plan is a product of years of work and we should be thanking officers for their dedication and their achievement in getting this over the line when other councils around us are struggling. It's been approved by an independent inspector an independent inspector who said it is fully compliant. It's compliant with our duty to cooperate. It meets all the legal requirements set by the Conservative government. He's accepted the housing requirement. He said it allows us to build sufficient social housing. This local plan provides certainty in a world where there is so little certainty thanks to the incompetence of this Conservative government. This plan is aspirational. It's innovative. It aims for prosperity for Harlow. Industrial areas are identified to promote jobs. Quality housing is at the core of this plan. Our green spaces are protected and our green wedges and green fingers protected. Actually, defined industrial areas providing jobs, quality housing, green wedges, green fingers. It sounds an awful lot like this plan is in tune with Gibbard's original vision for Harlow. And that, Chair, is why I am proud of this plan. And I shall be certainly voting to put it through. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ingle. Are there any more councillors, Lisa, that want to speak? 
or do we go back to Councillor Danny Perton for summing up? Um, Councillor Andrew, uh, Andrew Johnson has his hand up. No. Right, can I, Johnson? Okay, I'll uh, reply to the... Um... Is that okay, Chair? Uh, just a second. Uh, uh, Councillor Johnson, uh, uh, did uh, you wish to speak? He's with no, his... no, no, Chair, that was a mistake. Okay, thank you. Right, Councillor Perton, yes, if you want to sum up, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, the only serious point that's been made by the opposition has come from Councillor Hardware. All the other points are not serious at all, and in fact have been spoken about by other members. <clears throat> Councillor Hardware raises once again this old chestnut about development to the south and west of Harlow. The development he's talking about is not in Harlow. It's not part of this local plan. It seems to just that just seems to es escape him because we know he's not raising it because his technically his points are technically correct. He's raising it for political reasons. Yes, there was a disagreement with development to the south and west because we it was considered would be have an impact on the town in terms of congestion. So that when the Epping Forest District Council brought forward the developments for the south and west of the town and consulted Arlo. I personally, on behalf of the council, wrote a letter of objection to Epping Forest District Council saying that we couldn't agree to their developments because of the effect of traffic congestion. We then had went through a long process with Essex County Council, who are the highway authority, in case You've forgotten Councillor Hardware, you obviously are a county councillor. And uh, they came forward with measures which addressed the issue of uh, traffic congestion. I won't go into them, but they're fairly extensive. And it was on that basis we were able to withdraw our objection. We didn't object to, in principle to development around the town. That's a well-established planning policy. We don't build houses out in the countryside, which are unsustainable. Development is to take place around existing communities. That is planning policy and has been for 30 years. So really, this the objection of the opposition is purely for parochial political reasons. When we get onto the numbers, again, you know, we, <laughs> Councillor Johnson says we should build all the requirement for Harlow outside of Harlow. No, I'm sorry, it doesn't work like that. The, 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 the law requires us to provide the housing within our boundaries. We can't just say, oh, yeah, we'll have all that housing, but can you build it over there? You know what they call that? We all know what they call that. And so the only uh, significant area that's available for development in Harlow to fulfil our legal requirement was on the eastern strategic sites. We don't choose the sites. That's just something else that Councillor Charles doesn't seem to understand. We don't choose the sites. They come forward. The owners of the land come forward and say, we would like to develop our land. And we have to decide which bits of land we will accept for development to fulfil the requirements of the local plan. And those areas are the only significant areas for strategic sites. Now, what we, when we get, come down to it, talking about numbers, it just reveals the lack of ambition that the opposition have got for this town. We all know that when Frederick Gibbard designed the town, 80,000, which was the target, it's probably quite okay for a self-sustainable town. The way that uh, societies develop, that isn't any longer sustainable. And you can see that from the way the town has uh, deteriorated. In order to get to a number which is self-sustainable and attracts re sub-regional development, we need to get to the sort of figures that the garden town will provide. It, we're very fortunate to have neighbours who, who have been prepared to not only go through duty to cooperate, but to actually set up the Garden Town organisation with us, which has attracted significant government funding. 
And I'm sure that uh, although everybody, uh, some people have worked very hard to get the hospital, and I commend them for that, the fact is I don't think we'd have got the hospital if it hadn't been for the fact that we have a plan for a town of 130 to 140,000. That's why we've got the, the numbers to justify having a, a new hospital. So let's have some ambition. We don't want people talking about us being a small town, which is what we got last week from Councillor Charles. We are an ambitious town. We're a great town. And we're going to be even greater in the future with this local development plan. I urge you to adopt it. And I'd like to call for a recorded vote. Thank you, Councillor Danny Perth. Uh, seconded on the recorded vote, please. Recorded vote, please, Chair. Okay, yes, so it's please, going to be a recorded vote. Yeah, I'll right. With that, Chair. So Simon Hill is going to do a recorded vote, but we are looking at the recommendations for full council A to F that are going for the adoption of the Harlow local development plan. Okay, so now we come to the recorded vote, and Simon, can you start that one off, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. I'll call the names in alphabetical order. You can vote for, against or abstain. Councillor David Carter. Find the mute button. There's a delay on unmuting. Yeah. Yeah, it's happening all the time. Can we take a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Otherwise, we'll be here all night. Well, he's no. voting. Is he voting against? Chair? Putting his thumb down. Against. Yes. That is against. Yeah. Against. As in Roman times. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Councillor Simon Carter. Against. Councillor Charles. Against. Councillor Churchill. Against. Councillor Clark. For. Councillor Danvers. For. Councillor Davis. For. Councillor Dunn. For. Councillor Edwards. For. Councillor Garnet. Against. Councillor Hardware. Against. Councillor Harvey. For. Councillor Hoku. Abstain. Councillor Ingle. For, please. Councillor Gesard. Councillor Gesard. He's locked up. Yeah. Oh, Councillor Jezard, are you voting for or against? For. Thank you. Councillor Andrew Johnson. Against. Councillor Eddie Johnson. Councillor Eddie Johnson. Against. Against. Councillor Shona Johnson. Against. Councillor Livings. Against. Councillor Mallard. For. Councillor Perrin. <coughs> Against. Councillor Purton. For. Councillor Shears. Yes. For. Councillor Souter. Against. Councillor Strachan. For. Councillor Vince. For. Councillor Waite. For. Councillor Watson. For. Councillor Wilkinson. For.
Uh, Chair, that's uh, 16 for, 12 against and one abstention. That is carried. Okay. OK, thank you very much, Simon. So that means that um, 10A, the adoption of the Harlow Local Plan goes forward. Thank you very, very much. OK, we're now on to item 11, minutes of cabinet and the committee meetings. This is for noting only, so that goes from A to C. Noted. To, Noted. Uh, to Noted. OK, matters of urgent business, none. Now, at this stage, just before Christmas, I'd be inviting you into the chair's room, um, but we can't do that this time. So I do apologise. Um, but what, what I want to do is I want to wish you all a very happy Christmas, a happy holiday and a safe one until we come back in January for the next full council. So thank, thank you very you, much. Uh, Merry Christmas. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Happy Christmas chair. To you. Yeah. <laughs>